A lot of the suttas end with the listeners saying that they take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. It seems to have been a custom in the time of the, the Buddha. You found a teacher that you respected, and you asked for protection. I was reading a book a while back in which the author, a scholar of Buddhism, was saying that the Buddha just barely tolerated this idea. He didn't encourage it. But that ignores a lot of what he had to say about the role of a teacher. As he said, one of the duties of a teacher is to provide protection for the student in all directions. Now, this doesn't mean the teacher goes around with a sword and a shield, fights off your enemies. But the duty of the teacher is to provide you with a kind of knowledge where you can protect yourself. Where do you need to be protected from? Your own unskillful habits. And one of the biggest dangers is thinking that there is no such thing as an unskillful habit, that right and wrong are simply social conventions. You don't have to pay attention to that. Or that your actions don't really make a difference, that you don't have freedom of choice, that causes and conditions make you do what you have to do. You're not really responsible. And nowadays you actually hear some Buddhist teachers saying that, that if you think that you're responsible, that's self-view, wrong view. But that's not what the Buddha taught. There was one time when he went out and actually argued with teachers who said that you were not responsible for your choices in the present moment. It was either on the basis of saying that what you were doing was determined by past actions, or was determined by a Creator God, or it was totally random. It said in each case, people who teach that give you no basis for deciding that there is something skillful to be done, something unskillful not to be done. When you can't make that distinction, he said, you're left defenseless, without a protector. So your first protection is simply that, the right view, that there is such a thing as skillful action, unskillful action, and you have the choice, and you're free to choose. You're not compelled by other forces to act in ways that you don't want to. So that's the first level of protection. Then, of course, in the Buddha is teaching on the triple training, he's teaching you other forms of protection as well. And with the training in virtue, or heightened virtue, where you observe the five precepts, you observe them strictly. And if you're consistent in holding to the precepts, you're providing safety to everybody. They don't have to fear anything from you. They don't have to fear that they're going to be killed. Or that the things will be stolen from by you, that you'll engage in illicit sex with them or the people they love. So you're not going to lie to them. You're not going to take intoxicants and behave in ways that are going to be harmful to them. You're providing safety for them. And as he said, when you provide your safety in a universal way like this, you're going to have a portion of that safety yourself. Because if you can avoid unskillful actions. He said it's like a hand that has no wound. You can pick up poison and the poison doesn't seep into the blood. If there is a wound, okay, you're not safe. So as you hold by, by the <coughs> five precepts, you can rejoice in the fact that you're behaving in a safe way. And this is part of the protection that Buddha provides, not only telling you that there is such a thing as skillful and unskillful action, but also telling you what things are skillful and what things are not. The training in the heightened mind, which is basically the train, training in concentration. You're finding an escape from pain other than sensual pleasure, or other than sensuality. Because the problem with sensuality is it sets you up for all kinds of dangers. 
wherever you find your sensual pleasure. There will be other people who may want to find sensual pleasure in the same place, with the same person, with the same things. Some people are unscrupulous about how they go about it. They'll just take what they want. And as long as your well-being depends on that kind of pleasure, you're in a position of danger. The Buddha gives lots of images about the dangers of sensuality. There's the image of the hawk running off with a piece of meat in its talons, flying up, and other hawks and crows and kites are going to attack it to get that piece of meat. If it doesn't let go, they may kill it. Sensuality is like a bead of honey on a blade of a knife. It's like walking against the wind, carrying a torch. It's like being up in a tree eating fruits. Someone comes along with an axe, and he wants the fruits too, and he can't climb the tree, so he's going to cut the tree down. All these are images to remind you that there are dangers in sensuality. You don't have to look very far. Back in what Thomas said, it, we had 30-some dogs. And all the female dogs went into heat at the same time. And all the male dogs in the neighborhood came into the monastery. And the fights that went on. A lot of the male dogs in the monastery ended up maimed for good. All because everybody was running after sensual pleasures. And human beings are not much, that much different from dogs in this regard. So when you realize that as you practice concentration, you have a source of pleasure that is safe from that kind of danger. As you're watching your breath, there's nobody going to come in and try to take your breath away from you or push you out of the way so they can watch your breath instead. This is a pleasure that's totally inward and totally in your territory. And it doesn't have the dangers of the intoxication that goes with sensuality. So it's a pleasure that allows you to see the mind clearly and puts you in a position where you can move on to the next training, which is the training in heightened discernment. Basically seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. What's noble about the truths? Well, they force you to question your clinging and question your craving. Otherwise you're going to suffer from these things. But the Buddha puts a little question mark in. The things that you hold on to, the things that you're feeding on, those are where your suffering is. And your thirst for those, those things, that's what's causing the suffering. The suffering isn't caused by what people do outside. It's caused by your own actions. And as the Buddha said, the end of suffering is when you learn how to develop this passion for your craving. Craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, craving for not becoming. And even though suffering in and of itself is not noble, craving is not noble, his truths about these things, those are noble. Because they force you to question your attachments, question your thirst. You step back. That's the beginning of dispassion. Because dispassion comes from noticing that the things you're doing are causing suffering. And you start to wonder, is it really worth it? The third noble truth is there to remind you that there is a possibility for something better. You actually end your suffering by Ending your craving, ending your clinging. It's all through dispassion. Now, dispassion is not a gray, lifeless state. It's actually maturity. Again, it comes from questioning the things you've been doing, the places where you thought what you were doing was leading to happiness. 
You can suddenly realize that, no, it's not. You're growing up. Or in John Cha's image, he says it's like, it's like getting sober after having been drunk. The mind clears. So that cow in that far side cartoon, the cows are eating grass, and all of a sudden one cow lifts up his head and says, hey, wait a minute, this is grass. We've been eating grass. Or the Buddha's image of the blind man who's been given a soiled, dirty rag, been told that it's a nice, white, clean piece of cloth. And so he's very protective of it. And then finally, his relatives take him to a doctor and actually gives him his eyesight back. He looks at the rag and he realizes he's been fooled. So that's what the Buddha is telling us to do, is basically to grow up. Look at things that you haven't been looking at. Realize that what you've been doing has been causing you suffering. The, thoughts you, the things you thought were causing you happiness are actually the things causing you suffering. This is one of the best forms of safety the Buddha gives us. It saves us from our delusion. It saves us from our ignorance. So this is how the Buddha gives protection. by teaching us how to protect ourselves from our unskillful habits. Ultimately, even we get protected from our skillful habits. Because as long as we hold on to our skillful habits, after having abandoned the unskillful ones, we're still subject to inconstancy, stress, not self. This is where the protection goes beyond all directions. So that response of the, the listeners in the Buddhist times, totally in line with what the Buddha was teaching. He taught a path of safety, a path in which we can take refuge. Even his names were Nirvana. Nirvana wasn't the only name. Harbor, refuge, safety, security, the secure. And it starts by just teaching us how to provide safety for ourselves. And when we follow the teachings, that's how we take refuge, how we find refuge. And we're protected in all directions. And as I said, it goes on even beyond all directions. It's the safest path there is.